Great. All right. Um, so this is an overview of the content that this presentation is going to cover today, um, looking at who's setting the clinical hepatitis B guidelines, challenges to providing care for hepatitis B, um, talking about simplification of guidelines, which Amy led a great initiative, and I know Dr. Gish, I think, was part of that effort from the task force as well, about simplifying guidelines and management for primary care providers so we can make it more um, acceptable and accessible for primary care providers on the ground, um, what sort of resources and tools um, and decision calculators can provide real-time assistance with hepatitis B uh, treatment decisions in the clinic and where we can find affordable antiviral medications for patients. As you guys know, this can be a really big challenge. Um, and so making sure that you guys uh, feel equipped to have those resources. Um, so Dr. Gish, um, if you wanted to talk about the um, evidence-based clinical guidelines and who really sets the stage for those standards. Absolutely. So there's actually at least six, if not seven guidelines, national or international guidelines, ASLD and EASL are the two that are looked at the most commonly. These are complex guidelines that are evidence-based and evidence-based requires a, a grading. Um, although when they change to guidelines, to guidance from guidelines, they soften the requirements slightly in terms of data to support what was going to be published. Yet they still are often 20 to 30 pages long with uh, two or 300 references. And at this level of complexity, the guidelines often become a barrier to access, especially when a large number of patients don't fit the guidelines and they go into what we call one of the gray zone areas. These guidelines are being uh, modified. Uh, there's even an idea that the ASLD guidelines will be modified much more quickly than every five to seven years because things are moving fast and maybe moving even faster in the next few years. EASL guidelines tend to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of both simplifying uh, testing, such as Delta testing. They just said test everybody for Delta who has hepatitis B and ASLD remains uh, risk-based, uh, which is more complex. One of the challenges with putting risk into any one of the formulas, which the uh, guidelines and guidances still do for a variety of settings, including hepatitis B, is that risk-based testing has failed profoundly in the HIV world and the hepatitis C world. And it's failing so much in the hepatitis B world that we're expecting in any time the CDC to issue uh, recommendations to test all adults for hepatitis B with the triple panel to align with the uh, vaccine recommendations of the ACIP. Uh, that's sort of the short story of the guidelines, but they do look at fibrosis, viral load, um, liver enzymes, the presence or absence of cirrhosis, taking into account family history of cirrhosis and liver cancer as some of the top, top line uh, items for assessing whether a patient should be treated. They also talk about liver cancer surveillance. They don't talk at all about stigma. They talk very little about infectivity. They talk very little about the impact of hepatitis B on the patient's life uh, when they're writing these guidelines. So we're trying to direct the guidance committees to become more patient focused and not so computer analytically focused. And I think that's a pretty good elevator speech. Catherine, are we okay with that? Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Dr. Gish. Um, and then I think the next is just really looking at uh, the ASLD publication and practice guidelines as a resource. Um, we'll add this in the chat box as well as a resource for you guys um, for reference. And there's also additional resources that we'll be providing to you. Um, as we move through the presentation today. Any other comments on this um, paper, Dr. Gish? No other specific comments, although the most recent versions of the guidance and guidelines, uh, guidances and guidelines have put summary boxes for people to read. It does make for a little faster reading. If the guidelines come out in the next year, we're hoping they're gonna take an even more simplified approach. There's a major move underway in the hepatitis B community from a variety of KOLs to treat all patients who are HPV DNA positive. There's a whole variety of reasons behind that. We may wanna have an educational program on HPV ECHO to discuss that, but we really are trying to get simple, just like you heard about the University of Washington website project we all worked on to really take 36 pages down to five 
maybe we can take it down to one page. Definitely. All about simplification for sure. And this is just to show the differences between the various guidelines and, and what each organization recommends. And I think our case study today will do a great job at kind of showing how the guidelines differ and, and how you work to interpret the recommendations based on the patients that you have in front of you as well. Um, so you can see some of the differences for DNA levels and recommendations, um, as well as ALT DNA levels um, for treatment and, and um, ALT markers and E antigen negative and positive differences here. Um, any additional comments here, Dr. Gish? No new comments, just complexity. And oh, and one more idea here is to try to get these organizations to harmonize uh, this. There is an effort right now in the fatty liver community as there's been a shift in a proposal to change the name of fatty liver to metabolic associated fatty liver disease. And in fact, our article on that was accepted today into Lancet Gastro Hep. So I was really happy that that came in. It's a, really an overview of this new name. Uh, and there, uh, apparently there's a global meeting on fatty liver to try to harmonize terminology. So one of the other proposals we may have is advocacy working through Hepatitis B Foundation and other uh, you know, alliances that we have is try to harmonize the global issues. Of course, you may, may, may need to make certain things country or region specific, but you could still do that under a simplified umbrella. Definitely. And then this next slide really just goes on to kind of echo some of the comments that we've already kind of discussed. Um, and, and the fact that guidelines have often been written uh, by specialists uh, and PCPs often are not trained to manage hepatitis B, um, especially chronic hepatitis B within medical training. Um, and she notes how complicated hepatitis B management can be and also treatment decisions based on those previous guidelines you can see can be complex based on uh, individuals that you're looking at and, and the guidelines that you're looking at specifically. Um, and then that specialists aren't always accessible there's challenges with costs, insurance, um, and long wait times to be seen. So ultimately, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing this echo as well is to really empower primary care providers on the, on the ground to really um, encourage screening and management of hepatitis B and making sure that you guys feel totally equipped to handle it. And so hopefully some of these resources will, will be helpful to you and your practice. Um, so this is getting into the uh, National Task Force, which um, I'm a part of, and I, I know Dr. Gish sits on, and as well as maybe some others on this call, um, and the development of um, a primary care focused algorithm to simplify hepatitis B uh, management. Um, and this was developed by the National Association of Community Health Centers and the HEP B United HEP B Task Force Networks in the fall of 2018. Um, there were 73 primary care providers from 16 states and 43 cities um, that work at community health centers, and you can see the geographic representation here. Um, so these are some of the key findings that uh, from, from this group. Um, PCPs routinely screen for hepatitis C and HIV more than hepatitis B, um, and in order to uh, get primary care provider comfort with management, um, and this is kind of the order of comfort. Vaccination was the most comfort. Um, screening interpretation of results followed by the initial evaluation, HCC surveillance, and then treatment being the least comfortable um, among primary care providers. And you know, if you guys feel kind of echo that sentiment, you know, let us know in the chat box as well. Um, the biggest barriers for linkage to care for chronic hepatitis B were patients' insurance status. Um, and also limited English perfect proficiency and the reluctance to see other English speaking providers. Um, and when providers were asked about barriers to hepatitis B in care clinics, primary care providers reported feeling unfamiliar, uncomfortable with management, lack of access to or awareness to chronic management resources and no standard practice to care for chronic hepatitis B in their workplace. Um, so from the survey, these were specific resources that primary care providers referenced when managing hepatitis B. Um, up to date, the CDC guidelines, ASLD guidelines, a colleague or a specialist, as well as others. So in response to all of that, the task force group 
um, worked with the University of Washington, among others, to create uh, resources for management and practice and a simplified algorithm. Um, and let's see, Dr. Gish, I'll let you kind of take it from here since you are directly a part of that. And now we're getting more into the clinical aspects of the management. Well, this is the uh, primary care group, although there were a few specialists in this, this was written by primary care providers predominantly. Um, Carla Thornton from the IED perspective, I and Anna Locke had some input from hepatology, but they really wanted to take this message to the primary care community and say, yes, you can take care of these patients, but we as uh, colleagues and advisors have an obligation to make this much simpler for you. So you can look at three to five lab tests, a brief medical history and decide whether to treat individuals. We wanted to write it in you know, scientific English also, um, really condense the reference material and bring things forward uh, to the primary care community, give them confidence in a very busy clinic. It might be a clinic on Saturday where they're seeing 20 or 30 patients, but they can make quick uh, decisions with uh, relatively less information on whether to start or stop therapy, um, when to continue. Uh, I, I think the group did a fantastic job. Uh, maybe it's gonna be time for us to go back and look at this now, because I think it's four to five years old. Uh, but it's definitely a tool that everybody should have access to and consider reading and having at their, their desktop. Great, thank you. So now we're, we're just gonna walk through the, the guidelines and the findings, and then we'll be sure to share this resource with all of you guys um, in the chat box as well. Um, so this is the, the algorithm itself, which was created by this, this working group, which Dr. Gish mentioned, it was mostly made up of primary care providers. Um, and deciding when to screen uh, for hepatitis B and the results of the testing. Um, so if, if someone's positive for surface antigen, um, there's a management and counseling and HCC surveillance section that we'll show you in just a minute. There's also indications for what to do for perinatal hepatitis B management. Um, and then if that individual meets certain criteria, antiviral treatment, um, and then for negative individuals, looking at specific serology interpretation, if someone is susceptible to hepatitis B, so negative for uh, antibodies and core, um, vaccinate that individual. And then if they have prior infection, um, make sure that they are counseled on reactivation. Anything else specifically here, Dr. Gish, you want to add on this basic page? We really wanted to correct the, the false impression about core antibody being uh, a test that has a high false positive rate. That was true 20 years ago, but as of 2002, the core antibody test was markedly imp improved by Abbott and Roche. And now the false positive rate is less than two per thousand, even in low risk individuals. So when you see core, you believe it, you don't boost, you don't vaccinate, you don't spend money doing things that have no clinical value. Uh, but the rest of it was a, you know, a simplified algorithm. And we would love feedback from people on this, on can we make improvements on the next version? Definitely. Um, and here's the interpretation um, of the results, which this is stuff that we covered on our last session as well. Um, so basically, you know, what do you do if someone tests positive for surface antigen, anti-HBC and HIHBS, how that is interpreted? and then how that individual should be evaluated. Um, really want to emphasize making sure that any household and sexual contacts uh, undergo screening as well. And also if they're susceptible, vaccinate those individuals um, so we can prevent future infection. Um, if they're negative for surface antigen, if they're positive for anti-HBC or anti-HBS, um, this indicates a prior infection with the risk of reactivation, particularly under immunosuppressive medication, um, noting that these individuals are not at risk for transmission and hepatitis B is dormant within the liver. Um, if someone is positive for anti-HBC only, uh, this could mean a prior infection or an occult infection and would require additional testing, particularly HBV DNA, to see if uh, it's an occult infection here. Um, and then anti-HBS positive only means or indicates that that individual has been vaccinated and has protection for life 
and there's no need for booster vaccination, particularly if that individual has 10 international units per milliliter or greater. Um, and then if they're negative for all, uh, vaccinate all individuals. Any additions here, Dr. Gish? No, this is a simple, good, and again, we accept feedback. We would love some feedback on this. If people want to put it in the chat, we could capture that. And then also as we decide about updating this. Thank you. Great. Um, and then here's the recommendations for the initial evaluation of anybody positive for hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, so making sure that our appropriate history and examination is done, um, looking for signs and symptoms of cirrhosis, assessing alcohol and metabolic risk factors, assessing family history of liver cancer, and also uh, hepatitis A vaccination, and definitely vaccinating those individuals for hepatitis A um, if they have no immunity. Um, additionally, these are some of the routine laboratory tests recommended, um, which I might, Dr. Gish, if you're okay with just kind of briefly going through these as recommendations since we're getting more into the clinical aspects of this. So, you know, assessing fibrosis in all patients is standard of care, whatever their form of liver disease. There's a lot of information available on APRI for these online calculators that use very, very simple laboratory tests, sometimes gender, sometimes age. Platelet count is core as our liver enzymes, not liver function tests. These use liver enzymes. And this is really nice because they're free. Now, you don't ever do just one fibrosis test on patients. It's used two or three. My clinic, I look at seven different factors when assessing patients for fibrosis. But this obviates the need for a biopsy. And hepatitis B world liver biopsies have gone down to less than 1%. So strong tool, highly recommended. Fib4 to me is a little bit better unless the patient's over 60 years of age. Then I'm going to use APRI. Um, these are additional recommendations on counseling. So um, making sure that the patient uh, is in follow-up care and has a plan for follow-up care, um, making sure that they understand and are educated about the need for regular monitoring at minimum every six months, um, and then also monitoring for disease progression here, making sure that they understand that hepatitis B infection is a long-term disease with long-term implications at this time. Um, and there are risks associated with it like cirrhosis and hepto hepatocellular carcinoma, but those can be managed as long as that person does continue that follow-up. Um, making sure that the patient um, is understood and informed about all key uh, current and future medical providers of their positive status, especially if they ever need treatment for cancer um, or have un any sort of rheumatoid arthritis or other immune disorders, making sure that they're counseled on alcohol use and limiting that use, um, making sure that they uh, maintain a normal body weight, um, and then also providing education on how to prevent transmission to family members and close contacts. Um, and this is just additional recommendation here. So as you can see, it's, it's quite simplified um, in a very step-by-step -step process for how to manage someone um, with hepatitis B. And this goes into more detail about what to do with specific DNA levels and ALT levels as well. Any comments here, Dr. Gish? This made that move towards making things simple and it looks much more like the easel guidelines, but the easel guidelines is even vacillated between the two and the 20,000. And of course, in patients with cirrhosis, we treat any patient who's DNA positive. Uh, our move would be with this group and with the other guidance in terms of harmonization as DNA positive at any level and any patient would be enough to uh, start therapy, both from the fact that it's infectious, there's stigma, and cancer risk is increased with any level of HPV DNA. And of course, DNA levels over time it farther increase the risk for liver cancer. Liver cancer is the number one concern by our surveys we've done at the Hepatitis B Foundation, uh, more than um, you know, cirrhosis, liver failure, or transplant. Uh, and these medications we use decrease the risk of liver cancer by about 70%. It's quite profound. 
absolutely. So this is a continuation, um, just what Dr. Gish was talking about with the importance of HCC surveillance um, and, and how that should be done um, and for which specific populations. Um, so Asian or black African males older than 40, um, Asian females older than 50, and then persons with family history of HCC and then persons with hepatitis Delta co-infection. Um, I will say that specifically for African males, we have seen uh, liver cancer happen at younger ages. So, you know, definitely taking consideration of family history and other factors here. What we're going to try to do both for this guidance and also for ASLD and others is to bring the better or more recent approved uh, liver cancer biomarkers into these algorithms. We have much better tools now, including a very, very good prospective study showing better sensitivity and specificity using AFPL3 and DCP together with alpha feeder protein and something called the GALAD score. Uh, we have a large number of uh, cross-sectional and retrospective studies in this space. Um, everybody wanted a prospective study. Now we have it. Paul Pakros at a recent meeting said, yes, we now have plenty of data to make this uh, standard of care and in, in the guidelines. So this triple liver cancer biomarker panel, which I've been using for about 10 years, is now moving to the forefront. And remember, Japan has the best liver cancer survival in the world, both through early detection and aggressive management uh, better imaging protocols. They have twice the three times the five-year survival that uh, all other countries have. It's just amazing. And they use this GALAD score, this triple panel as part of their algorithm. More to come. Great. Um, so this is also looking at perinatal management as well. So within the, the simplified algorithm, there's a detailed description of you know, what's appropriate in terms of screening. Um, all pregnant women in the United States should be screened for hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, and if they're positive, household contacts should then be screened and then consider treatment based on DNA levels during the third trimester um, as well. And then making sure that the child receives the hepatitis B birth dose as well as the hepatitis B immunoglobulin to make sure that that child um, will not become infected or receive perinatal transmission. Um, there are also helpful de decision treatment uh, resources and calculators that might be helpful to you in practice. Uh, the Stanford Asian Liver Center's Chronic Hepatitis B Treatment Decision Tool for Adults. Uh, we'll be sure to share the links for this as well. There's also Clinical Care Options Hep B Consultation Tool um, and then MD Calc Reach B HCC Risk Calculator as well. Any comments specifically on these resources or has anybody used any of these in practice? Dr. Gish, do you have any recommendations on these or? Use them, explore them, see how they might fit into your practice and your clinical setting. I, I've looked at all of them and they all have good to excellent clinical utility. Um, so here's the Asian uh, Liver Center resource that uh, was mentioned. Um, so it looks at uh, E antigen level, any cirrhosis or fibrosis for ALT level, DNA levels as well, and it provides recommendations on how to uh, manage that individual based on those findings. So you can kind of see here kind of what it looks like. Uh, this is the con HEP-B consult uh, recommend or algorithm, um, which is a resource that additionally provides similar information on how to manage an individual based on specific criteria in a specific case. And then this is the REACH B HCC risk estimator as well. And so you can kind of see here what sort of uh, items are collected as a part of this. Um, and then it looks at next steps on how to manage that individual based on the findings from the survey and how that was filled out. Um, additionally, uh, one challenge that we often see in practice is medication access and making sure that medication is affordable to individuals. Um, there are some resources that are included within this uh, slide deck, which we will definitely share as well. Um, Gilead has a patient assistant program as well as BMS. Um, both of those resources offer uh, cost savings for individuals. There's also a 340B program and GoodRx, which is an additional resource. They were actually offering, um, in partnership with us, um, free medication for a full year 
for individuals who signed up and were eligible for that as well. So definitely we'll share these resources with you all. Um, and then we'll include some additional resources within the notes um, about other patient resource assistant uh, programs that we have on file as well. Dr. Gish, any additional comments on any of those resources or any of the medication assistance programs? Oh, you've done a great job of covering that. One interesting area in this pricing situation is the price of hepatitis B medications at the federal clinics, the FQHCs. And I don't know if it's different between the different FQHCs, but in Tecavir in our San Diego federal clinic is extremely cheap. It's uh, as cheap as some expensive bottled water. Uh, so uh, search around, look for these discounts, especially through federal clinics or rural clinics that may be state supported that may have special contracts. Yeah, definitely. And, and you guys can always reach out to us if you have a patient that's having challenges accessing affordable medication. We may have some resources that might be helpful to you guys as well. Um, all right. Um, so I wanted to open it up for any comments or questions. I know, Myra, you had some specific comments um, in the chat um, about the need for more awareness. If you wanted to comment on any of those um, chat box messages that you had. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. I feel like oftentimes when I point out to patients that they have a positive hepatitis B core, that um, this is news to them, first of all, that they weren't aware of that, and probably because their PCP didn't check. I may be the first one to have checked that, or perhaps one of my colleagues has brought that to their attention, and their, my colleagues will then turf the patient to me, appropriately so. And when I express to the patient the need to surveil them every six months, and that this could, if at any time they become immunocompromised, be an issue as far as the mor their mortality, they're very surprised to hear that. So I think that being the case, there needs to be a little bit more urgency in ensuring that those uh, populations of patients around the ages of like 24, 23, that they are properly immunized because they really didn't start immunizing infants for hepatitis B until around 23, 24 years ago, at least not in this, in the area where I practice. Um, that being said, we have a slew of Hep B core positive patients that um, um, I'm enlisting my colleagues to help identify, and we're starting to monitor them um, consistently. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Catherine. Thanks. So core positive patients, as a general rule, I don't think need regular surveillance. Um, there would be special cases where they may need surveillance. There is a subset if they're core positive only, again, surface antigen negative, surface antibody negative, where they have a cult hepatitis B, and that would be DNA positive and surface antigen negative. It has to do with test sensitivity. Those patients may be at higher risk of progression. Um, so that would be a subgroup that I would consider surveillance on. But in general, core positive, DNA negative, don't need surveillance unless they're cirrhotic. Now, mm -hmm. the core, meaning they have virus in a cirrhotic patient, probably is going to increase the risk for liver cancer. But you're going to do surveillance in a cirrhotic patient, irregardless mm -hmm. of core testing. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't spend too much time on the core world, except mm -hmm. to look for OBI. And also to educate patient about risk of reactivation, like you said, then they then they should get surveillance if they're immunosuppressed. Right. Thank you. And and, and thank you for correcting me, Dr. Gish. When I say surveillance, um, they're not doing the additional lab work. So you know, if they send them to me, I'll do the additional lab work. And if I find something, or if I see something in their history that's concerning, if they're alcoholics, um, if something in their risk is concerning, I'm definitely watching them a little bit more based and, and digging in to get more information about where they are. Are they overweight? Um, uh, are they heavy drinkers? Are they using substances? Um, I work in the middle of a, um, a very underserved population where all of those factors um, coincide all at the same time. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see we had a question come through the chat box. Um, should sexual susceptible close contacts to an acute case of hepatitis B receive HBIG as well as vaccine um, for, P 
for post-exposure prophylaxis? Um, good question. Uh, Dr. Gish, do you wanna answer or? I want to make sure I heard that <clears throat> correctly, that somebody had a high risk event, whether it's sexual exposure, blood exposure, needle exposure, and the, the person who donated, so to speak, was hepatitis B positive. Vaccine and HBIG, I believe is the recommendation in the CDC algorithm that's in MMWR. So I think that's appropriate. You want to get that vaccine on board as soon as possible. The HB gives very short-term protection. And the vaccine, of course, gives very long-term protection. And as you know, we have a couple of newer vaccines available. One is the VBI vaccine that was just FDA approved, and that should be available in pharmacies, I think, within a month or so. We also have Heplosav B, which is a two-dose vaccine with very high antibody responses. Both of these vaccines have a higher SPR or antibody response or seroprotection rate than our previous vaccines that we've used, such as Endurex, uh, Recombivax, um, uh, what's the last one? Yeah, Twinrix also that's in there. Uh, so it's exciting to have new vaccines and new companies in this space promoting vaccination and great timing, of course, with the ACIP recommendations. Yeah, definitely. And one thing that we always say at the foundation when we're talking to people who have chronic hepatitis B, we always encourage them to make sure their partner is tested for hepatitis B um, and if they are susceptible, so they should receive the vaccine. So that would mean they're negative for all of the panel markers. Um, they would need to undergo the series so they would not be at risk for uh, developing infection or getting transmission from hepatitis from their partner. Can I ask you a question, Catherine? Um, sure. You just read through that beautiful algorithm. I don't remember us talking during your read through about Delta testing and all B patients. Is that in there, that guidance? So I believe it is um, as part of the co-infection management for hepatitis B. Um, we kind of brushed <laughs> over that, but it's on page four and I just shared the link with everyone as well. So the serology testing does recommend um, uh, hepatitis D testing, hepatitis C testing, and HIV testing. And we need to remember hepatitis A, which you plugged in there, I think, earlier. Correct. Yeah. 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 But um, just so everybody knows, the algorithm that we walked through just now is a really helpful resource. I included within the chat box, and we'll include it within the notes as well. So be sure to share that within your networks, and hopefully that will be a helpful tool for you in the management of people living with hepatitis B as a, a resource. And if you have questions on treatment access and things like that, you can reach out to us, but we'll also include some resources within the notes for that. Um, Jenny, does that answer your question about um, vaccination? It does, thank you so much. No problem. Any other questions or comments? Great job. Thank you. And I'm sorry, everyone, that Amy was not able to make it, um, but we we worked through things. <laughs> um, that was one of the best charts that I've that I've seen. Really good job simplifying that, um, because when I first started looking at the charts, there are a number of different ones um, out there, as as you've indicated by either ASLD or, e, or easel or other sources, different universities. And it's confusing. But um, what you presented makes it all very crystal clear. And I, I look forward to sharing that with my colleagues. Great, that's great feedback. And you know, as you're using it in practice too, like Dr. Gish mentioned, if you have any feedback for, or things that might you might recommend for making it even more simplified, let us know and we'll take that back to the group and you know, we'll listen to what you guys have to say in your recommendations and it will certainly be helpful and much appreciated. Any, I, I heard that there were some possible medications on the horizon to actually cure Hep B. Dr. Gish, do you have any um, um, inside knowledge about where that is right now? Yes, it's a fantastic question. And the answer is a profound <clears throat> positive yes. There's actually over 30 new medications in development for hepatitis B with about 11 different classes of drugs. So they've really gone down many, many new pathways. And I always come up with what I, I think we're, where we'll be in three to four years with a four drug treatment combination. And that four drug treatment combination would include probably one of the nukes or super nukes. There's a, another nuke that's coming out that's sort of, um, it's a modification of an older one. 
that may be much more useful for long-term suppression. And then there's interfering RNA, there's capsid inhibitors, there's therapeutic vaccines, um, and things like endonucleases or CRISPR-Cas9 or entry inhibitors or other ways to stop encapsidation on release of the virus are all places that are being explored. That's an amazing development of all the virology we've worked on for 30 years. And then with hepatitis C, and this is back to being a capitalistic society, the return on investments with the hepatitis C drugs was so profound that it captured the attention of the investment community. Without the investors, nothing will happen. Um, the scientists are great, but they don't develop drugs. Um, advocacies are great, but we, we stir the pot. But the investors help make this happen. And a number of companies are getting major investment, although the incremental progress is relatively low. And there are some th things that have failed recently. There was a stop program from Alagos that did not work. It worked great in animals, but didn't work in humans. Not toxic, just wasn't effective. There was a combination study by Janssen looking at a combination of interfering RNA with CPAMs, and these capsid inhibitors, and looked like they didn't work together, which we were shocked because we thought this would be like a super boost. Um, so maybe Catherine, uh, through the ECHO network, it'll be time to have an update on the, the future of Hep B treatment. But I'm very optimistic because I'm from Kansas, you know, the rainbow, all that. Um, so I think within four to five years, we'll be reaching 40% S loss, but it will be um, 10 years before we get to a sterilizing cure where we get rid of CCC DNA, we get rid of the integrated virus, or we prevent integration. That's another way of getting at the integrants. Um, so a lot of excitement. This is a highly uh, caffeinated world uh, drug development. That is fantastic news.